All right, uh, welcome everybody. Um, thank you for uh, participating in uh, this uh, webinar today. I'm Jeff Marisek. I'm uh, here today to speak with you about post-traumatic leg length discrepancy, um, which is a, a fairly common uh, problem. Um, but uh, hopefully by the end of this uh, talk, we'll uh, be equipped with uh, some different techniques to address it. Um, I would uh, encourage all of you, uh, as you hear it, if you have questions, to go ahead and send them in. Um, and uh, we'll hold on to them until the end. And at the conclusion of the talk, uh, we will uh, address those questions. So relevant to this uh, talk, you should know that I am a consultant for Nuvasive. Anything else will be available on the AOS uh, disclosure page. And so what we're going to talk about tonight is really the causes or the etiology of post-traumatic limb length discrepancy and run through some of the varying treatment options. And then specifically, we're gonna focus on the planning and execution of a uh, correctional surgery or limb lengthening surgery using uh, precise technology. So limb lengthening in, in trauma, I think is very common and it can happen for a variety of different reasons. So uh, one simple way that can happen would be a malreduction. So somebody failed to get appropriate length on their tibial fracture or femoral shaft fracture. Um, or the patient uh, could then proceed on to a malunion, um, whether that was from an initial malreduction or because the fixation failed and the a patient shortened uh, late. There may be times where we intentionally shorten the patient, such as treating a, a humeral shaft fracture, or in certain lower extremity fractures, perhaps we need compressible surfaces, or a patient is going to uh, poorly tolerate a, a bone defect and we want to get them healed. Or most commonly, patients have bone loss and in the process of uh, addressing that defect, we lose some length. Like I said, the, the limb length discrepancy can be fairly well tolerated in the upper extremity and may even be an intentional part of the treatment plan for upper extremity fractures. Uh, historically, we felt that up to four centimeters of shortening would be well tolerated in the humerus. Really, when you look at it uh, more closely, uh, you're gonna experience a reduction in the amount of force that your triceps can generate beyond two centimeters of shortening. And so maybe that's not as well uh, tolerated as we thought. However, patients can still be quite functional with, with that amount. In the lower extremity, we used to think that less than two centimeters of uh, discrepancy uh, would be treated with just expectant uh, management and observation, perhaps a shoe lift, and even uh, really up to more like five or six centimeters before people wanted to intervene. Although I think those uh, numbers are changing in part because of uh, the uh, technology that we're discussing today. So in, in order to understand what's going on when you see a patient who has a post-traumatic limb length discrepancy, you need to start with a standard trauma evaluation, which is an AP and lateral of the affected bone. And it's my practice where I re would recommend getting a contralateral comparison because that's going to inform you what the patient's unaffected side looks like and what their quote-unquote normal is, what you may be shooting for during a reconstructive surgery. I would also then recommend getting uh, long leg standing radiographs like uh, you can see here, but it's pretty specific how you want to evaluate these. So you're going to uh, need some sort of calibration ball or marker and should really focus on having the patient's patellas pointing uh, forward. Additionally, uh, we want to put a wooden block under the short leg until the patient states that they feel even and then have your technician annotate that on the film so that you can remember as you go forward with planning how much made the patient feel even versus what actually is even uh, when you're doing your calculations. So you're going to be able to assess this two different uh, ways. One is by measuring individual segments uh, of the uh, extremity. So you measure femoral length, uh, tibial length, but also you can uh, compare it, the overall uh, apparent leg length by uh, um, calculating the difference between the heights of the iliac crest and uh, the top of the cassette. So you want to make sure you can see all the way up to the top. Um, the other thing you need to be careful of is if the patient has uh, some sort of flexion contracture 
uh, or can't quite stand up uh, straight uh, in this manner, you may need to get laterals of each segment in order to assess it because uh, if the patient has a flexor contracture, it's going to underestimate their leg length. So the next step in the evaluation will be to see what portion of the limb length discrepancy is true limb length and what is related to potential underlying deviations in the mechanical axis and what could be restored by deformity correction or what type of deformity correction needs to be performed in addition to limb lengthening. And so you'll calculate the mechanical axis. Here we have a calculation that was done with the assistance of some planning software. And in addition to the total limb length, like I discussed, measuring the apparent limb length from the top of the iliac crest to the top of the cassette, you'll also want to calculate the segmental limb lengths and compare uh, side to side. And then decide, is this a uh, isolated limb length discrepancy or does it uh, occur in multiple segments? So i.e. there's a femoral and a tibial uh, discrepancy. And then does it occur at the same time as uh, a deformity? or is it a, a pure axial plane uh, deformity? Depending on the amount of the uh, limb length discrepancy, the treatment may vary. And so uh, oftentimes for shorter limb length discrepancies, the treatment will be to do nothing at all. Fairly uh, low level limb length discrepancies can, can be fairly well tolerated. Um, and especially if they uh, have occurred uh, from something like an ankle fusion um, where a little bit of height was lost, that may even be preferable for their gait mechanics. Patients with uh, a more symptomatic limb length discrepancy uh, can usually start with trying a heel lift. That may both be therapeutic and also diagnostic in the sense that it can give you a sense of how much length you actually need to give them or how much uh, they're missing. The next step up would be to modify their shoes, as, as you can see here. General patients don't tend to tolerate this emotionally just because it's pretty obvious that there's a, a difference, um, although uh, some patients are perfectly happy with it. And the last option would be to perform some sort of lengthening, which could be done via an external fixator or via an internal lengthening nail. So the process of uh, limb lengthening relies on the principle of distraction osteogenesis or the technique of distraction osteogenesis. And whether you're doing this with an external fixator uh, using a classical Lizarov frame or a hexapod frame, or whether you're doing it with a precise nail, um, you're going to uh, rely on the same uh, biologic principles and the same techniques for your corticotomy. So there are three periods, a latency period, a distraction period, and a consolidation period, and uh, you're going to need to uh, pay attention to those. The process is dependent on uh, selecting the appropriate rate and rhythm, so in the femur, typically for uh, uncomplicated lengthening, one millimeter per day divided into four quarter millimeter increments will suffice. In the tibia, generally we go a little bit slower at 0.75 millimeters per day, but that may need to even be uh, slower than that in the setting of uh, trauma or biological challenges. And uh, sometimes you may want to divide that up into smaller segments like four or six pumps per day. When you're calculating how long this process is going to take, a, a good rule of thumb is that the consolidation phase generally takes twice as long as the distraction phase. So for example, if you're going to lengthen a patient 30 millimeters at one millimeter per day, that would be 30 days of distraction. The consolidation phase would then take uh, 60 days or twice uh, 30 days, which would give you a total of 90 days until you can expect that the patient might be sufficiently healed you add in you know, a latency period of uh, maybe five to seven days in the femur, and you're looking at close to 100 days for a 30 millimeter uh, discrepancy. So the process of uh, lengthening externally can be done via a variety of different mechanisms. So you can do it with a uh, pure fixator, with lengthening then nailing or lengthening over a nail. And uh, the lengthening with a fixator alone works very well um, and is relatively straightforward. Um, but patients generally dislike wearing the frame, and, and this concept of the external fixator index has been developed to uh, categorize how long the patients are wearing a frame for a given amount of lengthening. Uh, and generally, a lower EFI is uh, desirable because the longer they're on, the more likely the patients are to have complications from uh, pin sites, and uh, the less happy they are when they come into your office. 
Uh, so lengthening and then nailing or lengthening over a nail have been devised to help minimize the duration of external fixation, but uh, they present their own uh, unique challenges. So you can see an example here of a patient who specifically requested a frame uh, lengthening who is now getting close to having his frame removed with a nice regenerate formation. Um, but this has been on for uh, quite some time and he's not, not too happy with having it on. So just to show you a, a case example of an external based uh, lengthening, this is a 50 year old who had an open pilon fracture. He has medical conditions that cause immunosuppression. And ultimately uh, this open pilon was infected with a variety of different organisms. He also had some pretty significant bone loss around uh, the articular surface. And uh, so the referring surgeon had placed him into an ankle spanning frame, but you can see he was quite short uh, to allow for a closure of the soft tissues and uh, has undergone a, a pretty lengthy process of eradicating his uh, infection. So uh, as we start to uh, evaluate it, you can um, get a sense of the limb length discrepancy or what it's going to take to uh, even this patient up. Um, we felt that a uh, attempted arthrodesis of the ankle would give him the best chance at limb salvage, but that would leave him even shorter than he already was. And so we elected to do a concomitant uh, lengthening from above. Given the fact that we were already going to use a frame to fuse his ankle, uh, we decided to uh, use a frame to lengthen him above as well. Um, uh, and especially given this uh, uh, immunosuppression and uh, history of infection, we didn't want to put any uh, implants in. So here is uh, the patient immediately post-operatively, and you can see the attempted arthrodesis uh, below, which is being held and compressed with the hexapod frame and then a lengthening uh, setup above with the corticotomy. And then at the uh, conclusion, the patient has a uh, similar uh, leg length and a uh, consolidated arthrodesis at the ankle. And then uh, the patient has now uh, had the uh, ankle frame removed, um, but is still waiting for uh, sufficient uh, consolidation of the regenerate. And so uh, we don't have an EFI for you yet because the patient is still wearing his uh, frame, which uh, is something that does not make him very uh, happy. The other option would be to do uh, some sort of internal lengthening using either uh, precise or the precise stride implants. Uh, really, this technique is very similar in the sense of uh, how you perform your corticotomy, where you perform your corticotomy, et cetera, but the planning process uh, is a little bit different and uh, the instructions uh, and uh, patient experience is uh, different as well. So uh, the planning process for a precise really begins with um, where the corticotomy location needs to be. You wanna make sure that you're going to have a biologically friendly location and enough uh, bone stock proximal or uh, on the uh, nail insertion side to control that segment. You need to understand what the limb length discrepancy is and what your desired uh, lengthening is. And then you need to identify the desired nail diameter. You're going to pick your nail diameter based off of preoperative templating of uh, the, the limb. Maybe you know uh, what a previously placed nail size is. Uh, in this case, the patient has a uh, 13 millimeter nail in place, so we can um, plan to go uh, at 13 or even slightly lower at 11 and a half. And when you cross-reference a diameter with uh, what the desired lengthening is and the available nail length, um, you can come up with uh, your implant of choice. So a good rule of thumb when selecting a nail length would be to add five millimeters for the portion of the nail or five centimeters for the portion of the nail that uh, will be overlapped in the distal segment plus three centimeters for the exposed tip of the nail uh, where your interlocking screw is going to be. And then the uh, desired lengthening or the uh, desired excursion. When you add that up and you add it to the sum of the proximal segment, that should give you your minimum uh, nail length. And then you're going to need to match uh, the patient anatomy and how long a segment you have with the product guide to find the right nail diameter and stroke length for your uh, patient. So you can see in this case here, 
we're measuring out what we think is the desired uh, nail length about 245. And you can see that we've got the desired uh, lengthening of about 42 millimeters, three millimeters, uh, and then another uh, five for the um, a nail. So here's uh, one example of uh, an internal lengthening. This was a 60 year old who had, again, a, a peel on fracture. Um, he was treated at an outside hospital with this sort of internal splint uh, something and a pretty uh, poor soft tissue envelope. Uh, so we didn't think that we could uh, salvage his joint and he uh, went on to a, a tibio uh, talocalcaneal arthrodesis, um, which uh, went pretty well, but uh, the patient was left with a, a limb length discrepancy. And so um, he expressed uh, dissatisfaction with that. He was having a hard time going back to his uh, work doing landscaping um, and wanted to uh, get evened up. So you can see here is his standing films, which show that he's approximately evened up on this uh, wood block. And uh, unfortunately, at this time, we don't have a uh, hind foot nail that can pull from this lengthening. So we knew we would need to uh, come from above, and he was not um, interested in an external device. And so you can uh, see the surgical. Uh, procedure here uh, with the uh, corticotomy site pre-drilled and vented. Um, and then we establish an appropriate starting point for a uh, anagrade tibial nail, reamed up over it and deposited uh, local reamings, and then uh, completed the corticotomy. The uh, nail is inserted, and you can see that uh, we generally maintain our alignment here, but can then uh, insert some blocking screws uh, for two reasons. One, to maintain alignment of uh, this proximal tibia fracture, essentially, but also to prevent deformity in the tibia as uh, the patient's tibia is being lengthening with uh, the pull of uh, the uh, posterior and lateral musculature, which tends to accentuate that same uh, valgus and procurvatum deformity that we're used to in trauma. So you can see here is the final construct with uh, multiplanar uh, interlocks in the nail, as well as several um, blocking screws. Uh, and he's locked distally. And then you can see again, a, a fibular osteotomy to allow for lengthening through the tibia and uh, syndesmotic fixation to make sure that there's no dissociation at the proximal or distal tib-fib joints during the lengthening. This patient actually had some issues with one of the screws backing out uh, due to a technical error by the surgeon. So he was ultimately exchanged to a standard trauma nail once he reached the desired uh, length. So you can see that here and then he's gone on to heal um, and is uh, very happy with his uh, results. To, to wrap things up, here's another uh, procedure. 35 year old with a femoral non-union uh, was aseptic and has been sort of recalcitrant to multiple attempts to address it. And so uh, the Treatment of choice at that time was to perform uh, compression plating with resection back to healthy and viable bone, uh, supplemented with a, a medullary nail and bone graft. And so this ultimately proved to be successful, but left the patient uh, even shorter than he already was, and he desired to have a correction of that deformity. So you can again see our, our planning here. And one thing I would note is that particularly for femoral deformities, you wanna make sure that you have a uh, lateral view because the uh, precise implant is straight, uh, unlike standard trauma nails. And so you wanna make sure that there's not going to be any uh, cortical impingement or problem with inserting the nail. And so you can see here that our desired uh, nail length or what we uh, originally planned for this deformity was about as far as we could go with the straight implant um, for this particular patient. And so that, that planning worked out nicely. Again, a similar technique of removing the old nail, pre-drilling uh, and venting a corticotomy, uh, reaming up and depositing uh, reamings through that, and then uh, getting ready to insert the nail, completing uh, the corticotomy with a fresh osteotome. I would also mention that you can see a uh, Kirchner wire up in the uh, uh, femoral neck region uh, which was uh, used to control uh, or check rotation during this process. And then um, ultimately the nail gets inserted and in interlocks uh, placed. And then the nail is tested intraoperatively. So you can see a nice view of the magnet and the uh, internal uh, mechanism here. And so here is the patient's uh, end result. And this patient is actually still in the early distraction phase, so we don't have follow-up films.
but he's tolerating it very well. All right, so uh, in summary, uh, there are a number of different etiologies for uh, post-traumatic limb length discrepancy. Um, and uh, considering the, the source uh, for it uh, is an important first step. There are many different ways you can treat limb length discrepancy, non-surgically, external based, or using uh, precise uh, for distraction osteogenesis. And you really want to tailor your approach to the magnitude of the discrepancy and the particulars of the patient's uh, circumstances. When uh, you do choose to use uh, precise, uh, it's really all about uh, planning and preoperative preparation for a, a surgery that is uh, relatively straightforward and, and familiar to those of us who uh, are taking care of trauma patients. So thank you, I, I appreciate all of your time. We're going to open things up to the questions that you've been uh, submitting now. Uh, so bear with us for a moment and uh, we'll get to those.